Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast for water treaters by water treaters, where we're scaling up on water treatment knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Hello, everybody in the Scaling Up Nation. I am proud to be here. My name is Trace Blackmore, bringing Scaling Up to you. Folks, I want to thank you for making this show a success. Not only are you going to my website, scalinguph2o.com, and letting me know who to interview and what you want me to answer or talk about, you are also helping me spread the word to other water treaters that there is a podcast out there. And I know this because our subscribers are so much more than I thought that we would ever get to uh, at this point in time, and especially when I started the show. I would be happy if my family would just listen to this show. Uh, but uh, at the time of this recording, we have well over 3,000 subscribers, and that is just tremendous to me. So um, let's see if we can get that number up even higher. So if you will, spread the word. Uh, the more people we have listening to it, I think the better this show is going to get because that's more people that are funneling their questions to me, and it's relevant for every water treater out there. So today's show, I'm going to go ahead and get straight to our guest because I am super excited to have this guest on Scaling Up. He's actually one of the reasons that uh, I even considered doing the podcast. His name is Tim Fulton, and he is my Vistage coach. And he's going to talk about what Vistage is. But the short of it is in business, we're really good water treaters but we really don't know what we don't know about business. And it was with that, that I went looking for somebody like Tim. And I went ahead and I threw a friend of mine, actually he was on the show, Charlie Cicchetti. Uh, I actually uh, met Charlie Cicchetti working with him on lead projects and water treatment. And we started talking one day and he said, you know what, Trace, you are going to be a great candidate for this program called Grow Smart. And I know Tim's going to talk a little bit about Grow Smart. Now, Grow Smart's here in Georgia, and I can't remember the organization that puts it on, but I'll ask Tim and he'll tell us all about that. But I'm sure there's something like that near you. And uh, Tim was the facilitator of that. And every week he just gave us so much information about all the areas around business. We were talking about HR. We were talking about how to read all the different financial sheets that we have and how to keep score on all of that. Um, what to do as far as marketing and how to do sales. I mean, it was every aspect of business. And a lot of that, you know, I knew how I did it but I didn't know how other businesses do it. And I definitely didn't know what the metrics were surrounding that. So it was just a wealth of information. So um, to a little bit more about Tim and, and, and why he's on the show, uh, Tim is, is, is my business coach. So he's somebody that I talk to on a regular basis. And we talk about Blackmore Enterprises. We talked about doing this podcast and how that was going to uh, either be good or bad for Blackmore Enterprises. So he was somebody other than somebody that was in my company or directly connected with me that I can throw ideas off of. And it's not that he knows the answer, but I tell you, he definitely knows the questions. I am blown away with the questions that he asks and how he gets me to think about problems that I've been dealing with for a long time. I just haven't thought about them in the way that he poses the question. And normally that's the missing ingredient in order for me to make that decision and make something work. And then after we have that conversation, he holds me accountable to do what it is that I said that I was going to do. So I, I think I'm telling you all the things that Tim is going to tell you about what he does. So why don't we just get straight to the interview and, and truly one of my good friends, definitely my business hero. Um, please enjoy this interview with Tim Fulton. 
Well, I am truly excited today. My lab partner is my personal business coach, Tim Fulton. And, and Tim, you're one of my business heroes. I've learned so much about business being working with you and being with you for the last couple of years. So thank you so much for uh, coming on Scaling Up and letting the Scaling Up Nation know some of the myths about small business and running a territory and how we can do that a little bit better. How are you doing today, Tim? Trace, I'm doing great. And thank you for for inviting me to be on Scaling Up. It's my pleasure to be with you uh, today, and I'm looking forward to the time that we spend. Absolutely. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's just get right into it. So I introduced you as uh, a small business coach, and I, I, of course, know what that means, but a lot of people in the Scaling Up Nation do not know what that means. So how would you explain to them what it is that you do? Sure. Uh, Trace, I have the pleasure of working with about 40, 50 different clients that are all either owners and operators of businesses or they work for owners and operators of businesses. And some of them I meet with uh, on a one-to-one -one basis and, and, and coach them. Some of them meet in groups, executive groups, Vistage groups, and I work with those groups. And I, I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world that I get to work with really smart business owners and executives and what little known secret is I learn as much from them as they might possibly learn from me. I'm constantly learning from my clients and my members. Well, our journey started with the Small Business Administration. Is that the group? The that... Small Business Development Center and a program that I've been involved in now for almost 14 years called Grow Smart. It's a 40 hour training program that's offered by the SBDC, the Small Business Development Center, all over the state of Georgia. We've had about 2,000 uh, business owners like yourself go through that program. Well, the neat thing about that was you don't know what you don't know. And that was, uh, it wasn't an eight week course? Uh, five week, five okay. week class. I, and, and every week was a new topic and, and you learned something new and then it was over. And I said, I wasn't ready for it to be over. Yeah. And you and I started talking and you invited me into Vistage. So do you mind talking a little bit about what Vistage is? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, Vistage is a worldwide uh, membership organization for CEOs and key executives. It's been around for about 60 years. We've got 20 some odd thousand members worldwide. Here in the U.S., a majority of the, 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 the members. I've been fortunate enough to be a Vistage chair, a facilitator, for about the last, now going on, uh, 14 years. And majority of my work is through those Vistage groups and those Vistage members. Well, I know when I facilitate small groups and I always have a good idea where I do some sort of uh, role play or something, it always comes from you. I have stolen so much material from you over the years, but we won't tell anybody. Sure. Great. So uh, lots of territory uh, managers out there, lots of business owners out there. So let's talk about that. What are some of the myths that surround small business and entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. I've given a lot of thought to that because I have found over time, I was a small business owner myself when I first got started in my career the first uh, about 15 years. I owned and operated a variety of small uh, retail companies and, and made every mistake possible, every mistake possible. And I, I tried to learn from those mistakes. And over time, I, I found that there were a number of, of, of principles, number of things that I had read or heard that I thought were true and they weren't necessarily as true as I thought. They were myths about entrepreneurship. And, and give you example one, one of my favorite books early on was a book written called The E-Myth, written by Michael Gerber, written back in the early 1980s. And I just assumed that most small businesses were started by uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, someone who had a business idea, a vision, a, a picture of success, and they started a business uh, as a result of that. Well, what Gerber writes about in the E-Myth is that that's, totally false in that most small businesses are not started by entrepreneurs. They're started by technicians is the word that he uses. And, and Trace, the technician is the, is the doctor who starts a, a medical practice. It's the plumber who starts a plumbing business. It's probably the best example is the chef who, who starts a restaurant. Most restaurants are started by chefs. And so it's the chef who has worked for other restaurants through his or her career and at some point says, that's it. I've had it. I'm going to start my own restaurant. And so they do so, and, and that in part might explain why there's such a high failure rate for restaurants, maybe the highest failure rate of any small business is restaurants. 
And it's because so many of them are started not by someone who's well trained in, in business or someone who has a, a, a dream, a plan, an entrepreneur. But instead, it's this technician whose only experience has been working in the kitchen of a restaurant and then decides to start their own restaurant. Well, I think that's true a lot with water treaters as well. We're, we're very good technicians. We're working for maybe a larger company. They do something with their territory. We decide that we want to start our own business. And we're really good water treaters. Right. Yeah. But what about this business stuff? And yeah. like I said before, you don't know what you don't know. And, and Gerber refers to that, funny, as, as, as entrepreneurial seizure. It's, you know, at some point, the, you know, the, the employee says, that's it. I've had it. I'm tired of working for Trace. I'm, uh, too many hours, too much stress. I'm certainly not making enough money. I'll start my own water treatment business, right? And I'll, I'll work fewer hours, less stress, and I'll make a lot more money. Well, we know that's certainly not the case, not the case with all, all companies. And, and they, they find that out sooner than later. And they also make what, what Gerber refers to as a, as a fatal assumption. And then that fatal assumption he writes about in, in the book is that if they understand the, the workings of a business, if I understand how to prepare food, then I must understand how a restaurant operates. And yet what we find out once we get into the business is there's a lot more to be successful in a restaurant than, than knowing how to prepare food. It's all that all that financial stuff, right? And the, the hiring and firing of people and, and, and leadership and management and planning, all the things that were not taught in the kitchen, but are certainly integral to the success of, of my business. Well, and then we bring, to bring water treatment back up, we have owners that own water treatment companies, but then we have technicians in the field that are pretty much running their own companies within those companies. So my question for you around that is, does it ever get easier? Mm, that's a great question. And I remember asking myself that question many times when I was in business, thinking it's got to get easier. You know, the first year was so hard, the second year's got to be easier, and it wasn't. And then the third year, the third year must be easier. And it wasn't. And interesting now that I'm on the other side, uh, you know, working with business owners, I've found that it, in most cases it doesn't get easier. And and there's actually a term for it. It's called the growth paradox. And the the growth paradox is the assumption that as the company grows, it's going to get easier. And the easiest way trace to think about this is in just in terms of relationships. You know, if 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 I'm a one man business or one person business, and I've got one customer then there's two of us and there are two lines of communication. Well, that's, that's pretty simple. Well, now let's say that I, I add a, a second employee or I add a second customer. Now there's three of us. Well, three of us, now that means there's six lines of communication. Well, now things have gotten much complicated. Well, now I add a fourth client, a fourth employee or whatever the case might be. You see what happens now, it's 12 lines of communication. It's 24 lines of communication. All of a sudden, I have a very complicated business just in terms of the communication to and from my employees and myself or my customers and myself. So as the business grows, it's, it's just inherently more complex. Well, the good news is that over time, we get more comfortable managing the business or managing the territory, if that's the case, more comfortable with clients, more comfortable with employees. And, I, and then we get more skilled so it doesn't get too complicated or too difficult, but it never gets easier, never gets easier. And I'll never forget uh, reading a, a book that was written by a gentleman by the name of Doug Tatum here in Atlanta. It's called No Man's Land. And based on his research, what he found is that every bus businesses grow, you know, through different stages. And he found every business at some point grows to a point where it's almost impossible to make money. And that sounds kind of crazy that as I grow the business, you would think I would be making more money and more money. But the reality is there is some point in the, in the life cycle of a business where it's almost impossible to make money. Maybe it's because I've, I've got too many employees and I haven't grown sales enough or I've had to buy a new facility. I've got more space. It's just whatever the case, my expenses have now creeped past whatever revenue is coming to the business and I can't make money. And to escape that, I either have to accelerate my growth or I have to go back to where maybe I was before in terms of revenue where I was making money. But where I am today, it's practically impossible to make money. That's referred to as no man's land. And uh, funny because I find businesses grow their way into this, this no man's land. And it's 
terribly frustrating. And certainly if, if not only if I'm the owner of the business, but if, if I'm running a territory, I'm running a, a, you know, a second store, I'm, I'm going to be an audience to this as well and, and wonder why is it that we're not making more money like we should be. Are there any warning signs that you're approaching something like that? It can be. It can be that we have overstaffed. It can be that we've taken on more office space than maybe we, we need it where we are now. It could be that there's we've, we're experiencing creep in our overhead. Creep meaning, you know, certain expenses are just growing faster than we can we can pay for them. Noticing that maybe the debt of the company we borrowed too much money for the size company that we're in, or it could be on a personal side. It could be the you know the boat that I purchased or the second home that I purchased. <laughs> Those tend to creep as well as a business grows, and all of a sudden I'm carrying way too much not only business overhead but too much personal overhead as well. Well, I know you have said to me on several occasions that what gets measured just simply gets better because you're looking at it (laughs) and you're constantly after me to keep score. So can we talk a little bit about how important it is to keep score and what are some of the things that we should be keeping score on? Yeah, this was, this was a tough lesson for me as a business owner. I felt comfortable on in the marketing side of the business. I felt like I could sell. I felt pretty good uh, making a, uh, staffing decisions, but I never really learned the financial side. I just figured that was for accountants and, and bookkeepers and such. And I remember working with my dad. And one of the lessons I got early on when I was in school working for my dad was the idea that think of your business as a game. And any good game, we're going to keep score, particularly if you're as competitive as I am, as competitive as you are, right? It's all about, is are we winning? Or are we losing? And the only way to be certain of that is if we're keeping score. And so what I suggest is, is within the business, we need to identify certain key performance indicators, KPIs, that communicate to us how the business is performing. These are typically financial indicators. And it could be top line revenue. It could be gross margin. It could be net profit. It could be how long it's taking for us to collect our money from our customers. It could be return on investment as an owner of the business. What return am I getting on that? But key performance indicators. And the lesson I got from my dad, I remember, was there were three numbers that he tracked all the time. And and to me, that's a pretty simple lesson that every business and, and and, and any executive within a business, there should be at least three numbers that we're tracking on a regular basis that are pertinent to the business that we're in, the size of our business, the industry that we're in. And even going beyond that, I feel, and what I suggest to my clients is that every employee within a business should have at least one number that they're responsible for. So if I'm in sales, clearly I'm, I'm, in, I'm responsible for revenue. If I'm in, in uh, customer service, it's how well are we taking care of our customers. If I'm in finance, it could be you know, how quickly we're collecting our money or, or how much cash we're, we're keeping within the business. But to me, that makes it pretty simple. Is every employee should have one number that they're responsible for. And that's not only good for the business, but I find that the best employees want to be held accountable to something and why shouldn't it be a number that they can see, that they can manage to, they can chart, they can track over time. So I think it's important, again, not only for the owner of the business, but for anyone who's working in operations, who's who's manning a territory, is to ask themselves, what is the best number that I should be held accountable to? What am I performing to? So talking about key metrics, so where we are and where we're heading, but I know we also talk a lot about where we ultimately want to end up Mm -hmm. and specifically vision. So normally that rests with the business owner, Mm -hmm. but in our conversations, you say it's not Mm -hmm. only the business owner. So let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, yeah, that's again was an early learning for me because I felt like along with my title of, of owner and president, I was also the chief visionary officer. I was responsible for determining the direction of my company and the ultimate destination. Where are we going to end up in five years and 10 years? And I, frankly, I, I didn't know at times or at times I thought maybe we needed to shift our direction. And then I read uh, one of my favorite books, uh, Good to Great, written by Jim Collins, where he looked at, at about a dozen great companies. And one of the things he found that these great companies had in common was that they had what he referred to as a shared vision, meaning it wasn't up to the CEO, the owner of the company, to determine the ultimate destination of the company. It was up to the entire company, the employees, the frontline employees, the, the, the frontline management, uh, the lieutenants in the company, to collectively decide if we're going to be successful, what does that look like? 
What, is, what does success look like for this company? So then the, the president, the CEO is, is, the, is essentially the bus driver. So the passengers get to decide where they'd like the bus to go. And then the, the, the president is the bus driver. He or she directs the company in that direction, understanding that there, there will be course corrections along the way. And to me, that's, that is, is so powerful because it does say that everyone has a voice in terms of where this company is going. It's not a top-down approach, it's more of a bottom-up approach. And for the right employees, I think that's exactly what they're looking for, because then they want to align their own personal vision with that of the company. And to me, that's, that's a powerful equation for success. So for somebody who's a better water treater than they are a business owner, how do they begin to have a conversation like that? Well, one, I would hope that it would come up in, in the in the interview, the you know when they first are looking at joining a company and just asking that question is, what is the direction of this company? What is the vision for this company? And if there is not a, a stated vision, that by itself might be a, a, a yellow flag of sort. But then if the vision is to become the biggest, the fastest, the, the best, is then asking oneself, okay, is, is that what I want in terms of the company that I work for? Do I want to be with a, a $10 million, a, a $50 million company versus a $1 million or $2 million company that, that maybe there's more of an opportunity for growth for myself, more of an opportunity to learn the business. So it's aligning my own personal vision with that of the company. And it also gives me something to look forward to and to say, okay, there may not be you know a, a, a management position yet in my area of the company, but there will be. And that gives me as an employee something to grow into. And that can be very exciting for many employees. And I think in the book, Good to Great, he refers to that as the, the right seat. Mm -hmm. So I might be the right person, Person, but there might even be a better seat on that bus that the, the, the visionary is driving. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I know you talk to me a lot about business plans. And before you and I met each other, I thought the business plan was something that you wrote when you were just thinking about starting a business and you needed to go to the bank to get them to give you money. You take it to an entirely higher level than mm -hmm. that. So why is a business plan so important? Well, it's interesting that, you know, failure rate for small businesses is very high. And uh, Anywhere from 50 to 75% of all small businesses fail in three to five years, depending on whose numbers you, you look at. But it's, it's a high rate of failure. And why is that? Why do so many small businesses fail? And when studies have been done, research indicates it, a variety of things. It's, it's lack of capital, a, a bad business idea, the wrong industry, the wrong market. And yet underneath that, I think is a bigger issue. And I think it's a lack of planning. Fewer than 20% of all small businesses have any type of, of business plan, whether it's a formal, you know, a strategy, strategic plan, a financial plan, a marketing plan, an operational plan, fewer than 20%. And you equate that with a failure rate. And I, while there's certainly a correlation between the two, I think it's more than that. I think it's more of a causal effect that if there's not a plan in place, businesses are more likely to fail than not. And you're right, when a business first gets started, very important to have a, a document, a, a book essentially about how this business will operate. But then once a business is in business and is operating, I don't think it needs to be as exhaustive as that. What I suggest to my clients is something as simple as a one page business plan. One page where we communicate our, our vision, our mission, our core values, our, our long-term plan in, in today's world, it used to be five to 10 years. Today, it's three to five years. It's gotten harder to look further out. So three to five year plan for the business. And then one year plans. This year, 2017, what do we hope to accomplish? What are our goals? What are our objectives? And what are the strategies? And I think if we can incorporate that all into one page, we've got something that we can then share. It's almost like a, a, a roadmap. Think about whenever you or I go on a trip, sometimes I'm guilty of not taking a map and ultimately I get lost, sometimes terribly lost. And yet when I have a map, I'm far less likely to get lost. I know I'm at point A, I wanna to get to point B. And same thing with business. I'm at a million dollars in sales now and 10 employees. I wanna to get to $5 million and 30 employees. That business plan lays out what needs to happen for me to accomplish that. And it's, it's a tool not only for the owner operator of the business, but I think it's equally important to the, the, the number two person, the number three person, the area managers, even the people in the field something they can look at and get some sense of direction. Where are we heading? How are we going to get there? How often should you revisit that to make sure it's still the direction you want to go? I would say the, the plan should be written once a year. 
and then updated uh, on a quarterly basis and looked at at least once a month. All right. And you mentioned before, you know, a lot of businesses fail. Mm -hmm. That's especially true with multi-generational businesses. And the water treatment industry has, I don't know if it has more than most, but I, I believe it does. I, I think there's a, there's a lot of people that are retiring now that either their kids or their kids' kids are actually getting the business. Mm-hmm. And there was an article in Inc. Magazine uh, about a year ago, and I don't remember the failure rates, but it was something like 50 or higher percent for a second generational and 90 something for a third generational. So since we have so many of those businesses out there in the Scaling Up Nation, what have you learned since you work with a lot of them? Mm -hmm. And what advice can you give to our listeners? Yeah, Trace, I'm fortunate that I work with a number of family-owned businesses. And I have had my own family owned business. I worked with my father early on in my career. My wife and I worked together and miraculously survived. (laughs) I worked with my mom at one point. So I've been involved in a variety of family owned businesses and they're very tough because you're, you're, you're mixing, you know, family dynamics, which by themselves can be very complicated with that of a business that we've already talked about how difficult that can be. So now we're entangling those two entities and expecting, expecting success. And you're right, the failure rate on, on family businesses going from first generation to second, second or third are very high just for those reasons. So several things come to mind that I think are helpful for, for family owned businesses. One is, and I've got one that I work with specifically that uh, they meet as a family once a quarter. They have family meetings about the business. It, I find it's very hard within the business to have those types of conversations and to talk about, okay, how is the family doing related to the business? So that would be number one, to have regularly scheduled family meetings outside of the business, family members talking about the business itself. The other thing that I would suggest is to have a, a, a transitional plan. How will we go from first generation to second generation? and have that all laid out. And there are family business experts who who are, are in a strong position to help family businesses do that. Here locally, Kennesaw State has a very good family business program and they help family businesses write those transitional plans. Who's gonna take over? Is it the first son? Is it the daughter? Is it the uncle? Who's gonna take over the business? What's gonna be the responsibility? How will they be prepared for this? I think something else that I found helpful was before I joined uh, my own family business. I was put into a non-family business to learn the business itself. So my father was in the tire business and he wanted me to go into the tire business. But before we did that, I worked for a, for a different tire business so that I could learn the business under someone other than a family member. And, and I, f- I found that to be extremely helpful to see it through someone else's eyes before I went to work in, in, in the family business. So I'm a strong proponent of let the family member go work somewhere else first, get, get experience, make mistakes, and then come back and work, work for the family business. And then the third thing that I find that is oftentimes missing in family businesses is accountability. If you think about it in a typical family, there's not always a lot of accountability, right? Our sons and our daughters, we hope they, we hope we raise them right, we educate them, but we don't always hold them to a certain level of accountability. Well, in business, it's very different. We hold our employees, oftentimes, we hold them accountable. We hold them accountable for achieving certain objectives, certain goals. And yet with family businesses, I don't see a lot of evidence of that. Again, because of that family dynamic, there's not the level of accountability that I see in regular businesses, which is unfortunate because I think there should even be a higher level of accountability in family businesses than we might see in tradi- traditional businesses. And so putting on the paper, what is it that you expect of the son, the daughter, the, the, the spouse? And I tell them, put it into writing, create a job description that's very specific as to what they're going to be held responsible for. So those three things I think are really important. Great advice. Well, something that we talk about a lot, and I'm, I'm loath to bring it up because it's difficult for me to even think about, and it's one of the issues that we have when, when we're meeting, but you say I have to have an exit plan. Mm-hmm. And it's just very difficult. I'm just getting this thing started. I can't think about leaving it, but you say it's very important, and we've been working together to try to figure out what that is. Mm-hmm. So do you mind explaining to our audience what an exit plan is and why it's so important, even for a young business? Yeah. So- Trace, you may recall at some point, I'm sure you heard me say, 
that you will exit this business, whether you, whether you like it or not, you will, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And it's interesting that, you know, there's so much thought that goes into starting the business and relatively little thought as to how I might get out of the business. I suggest to my clients that it should be the opposite. For day one, I should be thinking about how will I exit the business? Will I sell it? Will I transition it to a family member? Will it be an, an, an ESOP, an employee stock ownership program? Maybe I'll just shut it down. Maybe it's just me. And at some point, I'll just, I'll stop answering the phone. That's my exit strategy. But we need to be, again, thinking of that from day one for two reasons. One, as I stated, because at some point you will exit the business. Secondly, what I found is that by thinking about it and beginning to position the business for exit, the business almost automatically becomes a better run business because now I'm preparing this business to operate without me, without the owner or the president of the company. And so then my employees have to begin taking on additional responsibilities because they understand at some point this business will, I will exit. So the business has to be better run as a result of that. So it's a win-win. If Even if I, I never exit near term, the business is gonna run more efficiently because I've prepared it for that. And then at some point when I, when I do wanna exit the business, it's going to be valued at a higher number than if, if I hadn't planned for it. The, the typical exit requires, as a process, three to five years has been my experience from the time I begin thinking about it, the time that it's ready to exit. And most business owners, frankly, just are not prepared for that. They're caught by surprise. And as a result, they don't end up receiving as much value as they should. And that's that's very unfortunate. So how does somebody get started even thinking about that? One is there are several, identify, okay, what are the options? Am I gonna transition this to a family member? Am I going to sell a business to a competitor, to a uh, what's referred to as a financial buyer, a private equity group, a venture capitalist? Am I just uh, what's called a, a squeezer? I'm a squeezer. Am I just going to keep working until I'm tired of working? And then I'm just going to quit working. That's a shut the phones off, shut the phones off. That's essentially a a squeezer. So what is the most appropriate exit strategy? And then from that point, uh, engage professionals, engage your, your CPA, your accountant, engage your, your banker, your lender, engage your attorney, your insurance agent, your, your wealth manager, put together an exit strategy team. Let them know what the plan is. Five years, 10 years, I wanna exit. Here's what it looks like. How are we gonna get there? And maybe most importantly are your, your key executives, your team members, the people working for you. For whatever reason, many business owners wanna keep this a secret as if they were never going to exit the business. Why not do the opposite? Why not share with your employees? Here's my plan. Here's, here's your role in this. Here's how you're gonna benefit from this exit. Now help me get there. Now it's a win-win versus trying to keep it a secret and then all of a sudden springing it on your employees on the day of exit. That never goes well. Well, and that brings up an interesting point because I know when you and I were just meeting each other in the Grow Smart series, one of the first pieces of advice you gave me and the entire group was to share all your financials with your employees and pretty much everybody in that room were like, are you nuts? And, and I took your advice and I don't want to steal your thunder, but can you talk a little bit around how sure. awesome that process yeah. can be? Yeah, it's back to thinking of your business as a game. And I'll never forget going, both of my sons are, are fairly grown now, but they both played baseball growing up. And I remember always going to their, their games and there was always, there was a scoreboard. Thankfully for the spectators, we always knew what the score was, who was up to bat, how many outs, what inning. But for the players as well, maybe more important, that at any given point, they could look up at the scoreboard and see how many runs there were, how many outs there were, what inning they were in. And I always remember going, my oldest son, Taylor, was playing high school baseball and we went to a game and there was a big electronic scoreboard but it was out of commission, it wasn't working. And so for the entire game, we went without having a scoreboard and it was the most frustrating sporting event I've ever been to. Because constantly I was looking up at the scoreboard, expecting to see the score and all I saw were, were blanks. And all the parents were all the same way. Very fr and the players were the same way, constantly players looking over their shoulder, looking up at the scoreboard and not knowing what the score was. Well, fortunately, there's always a, a official scorekeeper on the home team bench with a book. And so every inning they could, they could check and see what the score was. But 
the players were as frustrated as the spectators were. And I think that's true in business, that oftentimes employees, if they don't know, they guess. In fact, there was a study that was done by SHRM a number of years ago, Society for Human Resource Management. They found that 50% of all employees believe that their companies are generating a 50% net profit. Well, you know this, 50% net profit is, is it, you don't hear of that. It doesn't happen. No company has 50% net profit. 10% net profit is considered good. And yet most employees, because they don't know any better, just assume that the company they're working for is wildly profitable. And the owner's taking all that money and doing something with it. Who knows what? Putting it in offshore banks, maybe. And so employees, left of their own, they're going to guess. And they're going to guess wrong. They're either going to guess too high or they're going to guess too low. Pick your poison. Which would be worse for you as a business owner? And I know as a business owner, I was that way. I was hesitant to share numbers because I, I was worried. What would they do if I told them how much money we were making or how much money we were losing? How would that impact you know, their mindset, you know, their, their, their you know, beliefs about my company? So I, I shared very little. And I found my employees guessed. And as a result, I found they were then making bad decisions outside of work. Decisions like buying houses, sending kids to college, going on vacation. They were making budget decisions, family budget decisions, based on bad information from me. I thought, well, how, how unfair is that? So I began sharing information. I began sharing top line sales information. I began sharing expenses, expenses that employees had some impact on you know, wages, overhead, utility bills, insurance. And then something, Trace, something very strange happened. My employees started asking me questions about those expenses. Like, Tim, why do we leave the lights on during the weekend when no one's here? Couldn't we save money if we shut the lights off? Or do we really need to hire that a new employee? What if we all rallied together and took on that additional work ourselves? Would that help save money? They started asking me questions that I would, from time to time, ask of myself, but no one had ever asked my employees had never asked me those questions before. So not, not only were they making now better personal financial decisions, they were making the business stronger as well. So as uncomfortable as it is, I think, to share business financials, think back to that, that sporting event that you've attended, the football game, the baseball game, whatever it might be. Imagine sitting through that, those couple hours of a sporting event without having any idea what the score is. And now you know what it's like to be an employee of one of those companies. That's a great analogy, and I can't think of better advice. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the questions that my employees ask, and, and, and in fact, they're not employees anymore. They're part of the team because we're all making these decisions together. So that was, mm -hmm. you, you've given me a lot of great advice, so I don't want to say that was the best, but that was definitely well, up you. there. So we started off this interview by saying we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. How do you know? How do you begin to know what you don't know so you can start to know it? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a very good question. How do you begin? To, I think there are signs, and we may not always be visible to the signs or aware of the signs when we begin making better hires. When you know we're used to a good hire here, bad hire there, and all of a sudden we start getting a few people that are good hires and they're staying with us. When we begin to see uh, loyal customers customers who, who stay with us more than one or two transactions, who begin referring their friends and their neighbors to do business with us. When we begin to hear you know, positive things about our company from, from people in the community, the Chamber of Commerce, our banker, our CPA, third hand, our brand begins to become more established. It's the, some people refer to it as the flywheel effect. And the, the flywheel is big, heavy piece of rock that we're trying to push in. And it takes an immense amount of effort to get that thing just to turn an inch, two inches, a foot. And then over time, it gets a little easier and a little easier. And we notice at some point, there is motion to itself. That at some point, it begins to turn by itself. Again, called the flywheel effect. I think we see that in business, that, that, that at some point... We're, it's not requiring as much effort and we're getting better results. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> well, well, Tim, I've really enjoyed this interview and it's not quite over yet right. because we still have the lightning round oh, yet Here to we come. Go. Here we go. All right. So what were the last three books that yeah. you've read? Uh, I'm almost finished reading a book right now called Everyone Lies. It's a fascinating book written by a behavioral economist who use, uses Google data to, to predict 
what's going to happen uh, to society, what's going to happen to individuals. And it's just a very interesting book. Uh, before that, a book called, oh, it's a book on exit strategy. The, the title, I, I should have written it down. I'll come back to it. I'll come back to that one. And then the, uh, the third book is about habits. It's called The Power of Habits. Very interesting book. You may recall, because I had a number of my members read this book about the role that habits play, not only in our personal lives, but in business as well. Very interesting book. For fun, do you want to share the chocolate chip cookie excerpt from the from that book? Right. Well, the author of the book had a habit, and he, he thought it wasn't such a good habit, that about 3 o'clock every afternoon, he would get out of his seat, out of his office, and walk down to the company cafeteria to get a chocolate chip cookie. And as a result of that, he, he was he probably a little heavier than he wanted to be, and it just it didn't jive with his diet too well. So he decided he wanted to change that habit. So he examined it. He said, okay, why is it? Why is a chocolate chip cookie at three o'clock every day? And what he realized is that with any habit, there is a, there's a cue, something that triggers the habit. And then there's the, the habit itself. And I forget the term that he used for it, you may recall. And then there's the result of the habit. Well, the cue was three o'clock, just a little bell went off his head. It's three o'clock. I got to get out of my seat. And there's also maybe a little bit of hunger involved, three o'clock mid-afternoon, and a desire to switch gears, do something different than he'd been doing during the course of the afternoon. So there was the cue. So he'd get out of his chair, he'd go to the cafeteria, he'd buy a chocolate chip cookie. But then he'd also, he'd, he, there'd be other people in the cafeteria, and he'd sit down and have a conversation with one person, and then he'd have a conversation with a second person. And he found this was really fun, just being able to see other people and, and strike up conversations about football, about kids, whatever. Then he, and then, so then the execution was buying the chocolate chip cookie and then spending some time away from his desk. And then the result was, you know, he was able to go back to his work. He was a little more productive for the remainder of the day. And he felt good. So then he thought, well, you know, is it possible that I could come up with a different cue than that chocolate chip cookie and getting up at three o'clock? So he tried it. He went down and three o'clock and instead of getting the chocolate chip cookie, he got something healthier to eat. And he realized it wasn't about the chocolate chip cookie because he still saw the people he enjoyed spending time with. He still got the break he needed mid-afternoon. So he got all the benefit without that chocolate chip cookie. So then he tried one more thing. Uh, he decided instead of going to the cafeteria, just at three o'clock, get up and go outside and go for a walk. And what he found, the reward was just about the same. He got the break from work. He got a little bit of exercise. He would bump into someone he knew when he went for the walk. So he got the social aspect of it. So the idea was just to break these habits down into what is the cue, what happens you know, as a result of the cue, what's the habit itself, and what's the reward. And it's, it's a really interesting and powerful way to look at the things that we just take for granted every single day. I tell you, you also have one of the most extensive business book reading lists that I've ever seen. And I've, I've, I've actually been privileged to see it and I've I haven't read all of them mm -hmm. but the ones that I have read have been tremendous to my business mm -hmm. what are the top three business books people need to read the book I was trying to remember is called finish big and it's written by Bill Burlington he's an editor with Inc magazine about how to how to exit your business so three best well, I've mentioned two of them one is the the e myth that's an all-time favorite written by Michael Gerber I read that very early in my it was given to me very early in my career and it changed my whole mindset about the design of a business I never, never forget one of the things Gerber says is you know when you're planning for your business as we talked about earlier think of your business as the first of 10,000 locations and I'd never looked at business that way that this could be the first of 10,000 locations. So Emeth was one, Good to Great, I mentioned, written by Jim Collins, all-time favorite. What is it that great companies do that good companies don't do as well or, or not enough of? And then he had several books that followed Good to Great that were, 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 were equally good reads as well. And then one group that, that certainly I know is a favorite of yours, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, written by Stephen Covey. Covey. That, I, I, th I might have even read that before the Emeth. Right out of college, I remember reading that book, and it was it was just an eye opener for me. What what was going to be needed of me to be successful, not only in my career, 
but in my personal life as well. You know, I had a listener write in. They know I was uh, uh, very involved with Seven Habits, and I still am. Mm-hmm. They asked if I would do a show on that. I don't know if that would play well. What do you think? Oh, I, th- I think you could do multiple shows about that book. All right. We'll have to see what the listeners think. I want to okay. make sure that I don't get tuned yes. out, but uh, oh, I think yes. I'll... <laughs> oh, yes. So let's not get off the book subject okay. quite yet, because yeah. I know you say that there's a book in everybody, yeah. and you, you've been on me for years mm-hmm. to finish the book that I've been trying to write, and it's still not finished. But you finished several, so tell us a little bit about yours. Yes. I, I, I would tell all my clients that they, each of them has a book in them, and they would look at me and say, well, where's your book? I said, okay, I, I got to go first. So I've been writing articles for my newsletter, Small Business Matters, for almost 20 years now, and I thought, why don't I just put those articles together, those essays together into a book. And that's what I did five years ago. The first book was called Small Business Matters. And very fortunate, the book, you know, for my own purposes, I thought if I could get, you know, one reader, one one sold book, I was doing pretty well. And a couple thousand books have been sold. And as a result of that, I wrote a second book a year ago, uh, same format, essays, articles that I've written. And that book is called Small Business Matters and All That Jazz as a tribute to my my time in New Orleans where I went to school at Tulane and the time that I spent in the French Quarter, sometimes too much time in the French Quarter, not enough <laughs> time in class, but a, a tribute to New Orleans and one of my favorite cities. And those two books, I've been very fortunate that you know, I've been able to share you know, with many of my clients and, and such and feel very lucky. Well, speaking of jazz, I know mm-hmm. you do a, a business gathering mm-hmm. every year, except for this past year, unfortunately, mm-hmm. called Small Business Matters. Mm-hmm. And the last one, the theme, had a jazz mm-hmm. theme to it. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? No, not at all. Uh, Seth Godin is one of my favorite marketing gurus. He does a great daily blog. And he wrote a book called Tribes. And in the book, he suggests that all of us, no matter where we are, what we do, we all have a tribe. We have a group of people that we're a part of and decide some degree lead. And and I recognize that, that I have clients, I have strategic partners, I have participants of the Growth Smart program. And I've always wanted to connect those people and try to find a way, how do I connect Trace with Charlie and Charlie with Cindy? How can I put these people together? And the idea came, why not have a, why not have a party for all of, of, the, of the members of my tribe as the, as the chief of that tribe, so to speak, the mayor of my village, why not have a party? And so I decided, but I couldn't call it a party because I didn't, I didn't want people to get the wrong impression, so I called it a conference. And started five years ago, the Small Business Matters Conference, and I was hoping that we would have 50 or 75 people that would show up for it, a one-day conference here in Atlanta. The format was uh, essentially a, a TED format, TED Talks, 15-minute talks. And we had over 100 people show up that, that first year, and that reinforced for me not only the, the, the importance to me of holding the event, but how others enjoy being able to, to meet people and, and, and hear interesting presenters. So then this uh, a year ago it was the fourth year we had over 200 people that showed up for the for the conference and I'm looking forward if all goes well to hosting the, the fifth conference in May of 2018. I hope you'll join us. Absolutely. I missed the one in 2017 so I'm glad to hear there's going to be a 2018. So obviously with all the things that you've done in your life they're going to make a movie about you. <laughs> So when they do, who plays Tim Fulton? Yeah, I'm used to asking that question. That's actually, you are the one I got that question from. So again, another thing I've stolen from you. So the short answer is David Letterman. David Letterman. Because on occasion, when I'm doing a class or speaking, I'll have someone come up to me afterwards and say, you know who you remind me of? And I'll say, I have have no idea. And they'll say, you look like and sound like David Letterman. And I take that as a huge compliment because David Letterman, I watched him when he had his first daytime talk show back in the 1980s and always been a, I've been a huge fan of his. And maybe that's where some of the, the, the commonality comes from. So I, you know, David Letterman would play me in the movie. I think I was one of the people that came up to you and said that. So, you know, obviously David Letterman, so, but also you're, you're very big into comedy and you've done stand-up before. Yeah, that's so how did that go? Frightening. Well, I'm, I'm a lifetime learner <laughs> and I took a, I signed up for, registered for a night class at Emory on writing comedy, humor, how to inject more humor into your writing, which that's, I I knew there was a need for that in my writing. So I I signed up for this class and I showed up for the first class 
and the instructor said the final exam is you will get on stage at Eddie's Attic here in Atlanta and you will perform like eight minutes of comedy. You're going to have to write it and perform it. And right away, about a third of the class walked out. <laughs> they said, that is not what I signed up for. Well, I had driven too far that night and made too much of a commitment to do that. And I thought, well, how bad could it be? How bad could, you know, eight minutes of stand-up be? Well, the reality, it was the most terrifying eight minutes <laughs> of my life. And so I wrote, you know, over the course of the class, wrote the, the bit, so to speak, and practiced it and practiced it. And finally, the night came and I made the mistake of inviting not only family members, but several of my clients were there as well. And the place was packed with people, which was very unfortunate. <laughs> and I'll never forget getting up there. And it, it, it went by very quickly. And, and it, I, I guess it went pretty well. And one indication of that is I had a young guy come up to me afterwards. And he said, right after I finished, he came up to me and said, you know what? When you got up there, I thought you were going to stink. I thought it was going to be really bad. And he said, you know what? You weren't bad. And I took that as a compliment. Well, uh, there that, you go. That was, that was that was my first and only stint on a, a stand-up comedy. Well, I know you recommended that we do that as our Vistage group, and I don't think anybody took you up on it. No. However, that being said, I know uh, Jeffrey Gittimer, big sales coach, mm -hmm. he says that's one of the best things that you can do to help you in the sales community is to do some improv and do mm -hmm. some stand-up. Well, that is also evidence just for leaders in business to, to be able to engage in humor, and whether it's poking fun at yourself or something else going on, just it tends to lighten the mood around you and your business. Good way to start a meeting. You want to be very careful, of course, anytime using humor, but if used effectively, it, it can boost your, your currency, your effectiveness as a leader. Great advice. Hmm. So, and maybe our group will change their mind. I doubt it, but but maybe we'll all be doing stand-up yeah. soon. All right. So our final question, mm. and, and this has been a lot of fun. I, I really appreciate you coming great. on. So uh, you can talk to anybody throughout history. Mm -hmm. Who would it be and why? So the one that comes to mind first is Ben Franklin. And I know that's a, that's a popular choice. That is a popular scaling up choice, but a good choice. A good, uh, choice. I remember reading Franklin's autobiography and I was fascinated that he had so many different interests. He had this very successful printing business in Philadelphia, one of the largest of its kind. He was also a scientist, a mathematician. He was an, an inventor. He was involved in education. Of course, he was involved in government. But maybe what, what struck me the most was that he was the first person that we know of to come up with this idea in this country of business people getting together to talk about their businesses. And he referred to these groups as juntos, J-U-N-T-O-S, juntos. And his groups, his juntos, would get together once a week. And I love the format because so many of my groups get together during the day. They get together for breakfast. They get together for lunch. Franklin's group got together in the evening. And my groups get together in a boardroom. They get together in a, in a hotel. Franklin's group got together in a bar, in a tavern. And they would have dinner. They would have beer and wine. And they would go into the early morning, these business owners and operators, talking about their business. What's working? What's not working? What have you heard lately? What, what do you know? Just asking questions. So Franklin would use the Socratic approach to getting these business owners to talk to each other and share information to what we now know as, as chambers of commerce and industry groups. You know, the, the Juntos were the, the originals of that. So Franklin gets do credit for that. And I, I, the opportunity to sit down with him over a beer, how interesting would that be? Well, Tim, the fun thing throughout the years, you and I have interviewed, or you've interviewed me, mm -hmm. and you always say that's the last question, but you always have one more you throw at. So I've got, I said it was the last question, but I've got one more I'm throwing that's, at that's you. That's fair. That's fair. So um, the one thing that you want people to take away from this as a business coach, mm. as people that are running successful territory, successful businesses, what's the one thing you want them to take away? That's the one thing is, um, boy, that is a great question. I love it that my question stumped yeah. you because all of your questions always stump me. Yeah. The one thing that I, that I suggest repetitively to many of my clients is to listen to that little voice in the back of our head whether it's a, a, a decision within the business, maybe it's a decision to open a business, 
Maybe it's a decision to spend more time with our kids, but to not only listen to, but act on that little voice that we hear, because it's usually based on reason and based on experience. And more often than not, it's, it's, it's correct. And too often we don't listen to that little voice and, and we listen to other voices or we don't make any decision. You know, we do nothing. And so it's, it's to trust our, our instincts. And whether, again, it's to start a business or to grow a business or maybe to exit a business, but to just to trust your, your instincts because they've been honed over time and more often than not, they're, they're, they're accurate. I, th- I think that's a great one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, last thing, I know you do a newsletter. Mm-hmm. So if somebody wants to get your newsletter, how would they do that? Sure. It's a monthly newsletter. It's called Small Business Matters. You can email me at Tim Fulton at smallbusinessmattersonline.com or just visit the website, smallbusinessmattersonline.com. There's information about the newsletter, the books. By the way, any, any listeners to Scaling Up, a privileged group, I might say, 20% discount on the book. Wow. If you order a book, mention Scaling Up, 20%. That includes shipping, freight, everything. Also, information about the conference. There are uh, there's a resource center on the website, so I encourage your listeners to take advantage of, of everything that's on the website. Excellent, and I'll be sure a lot of my listeners are driving right now, mm-hmm. so they don't have to take notes. This will be on my show notes. Keep your hands on the wheel. Exactly, <laughs> Tim. Thanks so much for coming on. This was so much fun. Tracy, it was a pleasure. Thank you. I can't tell you how exciting and fun that was for me. I could not think more of the man who you just heard. He has helped me in so many different ways of just learning about my business. Now, mind you, he doesn't know a thing about water treatment. Tim Fulton, you are a lousy water treater, but he does know business and he has, again, the magic is in the questions that he asks and how he holds me accountable in what I say that I'm going to do. So it was it was truly an honor to have him on the show. So I'm doing a little bit of hero worship here. So just bear with me, folks. Um, but I just think it's really cool that I've got a platform that, uh, that he came on. All right. So he mentioned a couple of things. Uh, he said that books that we should all be reading were The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, uh, Good to Great, Built to Last, and then my favorite book of all time, this is number one on my list, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen R. Covey. So I'm going to have links to those so you don't have to worry about writing them down on my website. But again, in the interview... Uh, And I've received not a lot of questions, but a couple of questions because at the uh, training, I allude to some of the things that I learned. And I'm talking about the AWT training, of course. I allude to a couple of things that I learned through the seven habits of highly effective people. And people have asked me, would I do a show on specifically how to keep a schedule, how the seven habits of highly effective people or how that system actually trains you? So I'm curious. So let me know if you will. You guys were great when I've asked you questions in the past and should I do this or shouldn't I do it? So this is the question I have. Should we do a show on uh, on seven habits and maybe you guys read the book along with me? I'm not going to read it on the air, but maybe we can talk about it. So uh, let me know what you think about that and give me some ideas on that. I will tell you that I cannot think of a better book to personally help your own development than The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So um, if you haven't noticed, I am a fan of the book. So let me know what you think about that, and we will move forward with that. Again, go to my show notes page. All the notes from today will be up there. If you wanted to subscribe to Tim's newsletter, lots of good information on that. Uh, I'll have that on there. And again, I want to thank you for listening to the show. I want to thank you for doing that because I wouldn't be able to do this if you guys were not listening. So thank you for that. Keep those questions coming. And remember, try to be a better water treater tomorrow than you were today. Have a great week, folks. 